This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Anarchism and the National Liberation Struggle, 3rd South African Edition, February 2019, by Alfredo M. Bonanno. The anarchist program concerning the National Liberation Struggle is very clear. It must not go towards constituting an intermediate stage towards the social revolution through the formation of new national states. Anarchists refuse to participate in national liberation fronts. They participate in class fronts, which may or may not be involved in national liberation struggles. The struggle must be spread to establish economic, political, and social structures in the liberated territories based on federalist and libertarian principles. Alfredo Bonanno, 1978. This important pamphlet attempts to develop an anarchist international the ever-present reality of national liberation struggles and the national question. Wide-ranging in the topics it covers, from internal colonization to a critique of certain Marxist views, the pamphlet argues that anarchists should support national liberation struggles insofar as they are waged by and for the oppressed classes, and that the national question can only be resolved by the free association of peoples on a libertarian and federalist basis. Humanity will never be free until we liberate ourselves by global social revolution. Third South African edition, February 2019. Introductions. Introduction to the 1994 South African edition, revised by Lucien van der Valt. This pamphlet represents an attempt to develop an anarchist internationalist stance on the ever-present and ever-controversial issue of the National Liberation Struggle, NLS, and, more broadly, the national question itself. We can broadly understand the NLS to mean a struggle against a relationship of exploitation and domination involving a national group. Such a struggle is of obvious importance to us as anarchists, because we are opposed to all oppression and believe that it must be ended by revolutionary action. The topics covered by Bonanno range from internal colonization, imperialism, class identity, to incisive critiques of certain Marxist positions on the issue. However, two main arguments are made in this text. Firstly, he argues that only revolution, based on libertarian and federalist structures, can make possible the free association of human groups, thereby solving the national question. Secondly, and far more importantly for our purposes, Bonanno makes the case that anarchists should fully support national liberation struggles, i.e. against imperialism and internal, internal colonialism, insofar as they are the struggles of the oppressed classes workers and peasants themselves. This is, diff this is because different classes within the oppressed nation have different interests and therefore also end goals within the NLS. That of the national aspirant capitalist cum politician class is to exploit and dominate their compatriots. This is obviously no solution at all for the oppressed classes. What Bonanno is pointing to is that the NLS can assume a variety of forms, ranging from revolutionary class struggle against oppression, aiming at the institution of an anarchist society, to a nationalist class alliance form, typically concerned with forming a national state. This may be the division of an existing state into several new ones, as in Czechoslovakia, or the reshaping of an old state into a new form, as in South Africa. But whatever the form of the new state, its function is that of all states, to serve ruling class interests. As it stands, the pamphlet has only one real problem. Although Bonanno repeatedly refers to quote-unquote exploitation, no mention whatsoever can be found of domination. Yet, as anarchists, we are not merely opposed to exploitation, but unequal power relations themselves. It is precisely this that distinguishes us from other socialists, and it is precisely for this reason that we favor federalist and libertarian forms of organization. 
But the pamphlet is still clearly highly relevant to South Africa. Firstly, black people have long been engaged in what might be conceptualized as a national liberation struggle against post-colonial white settlerism or colonialism of a special type, i.e. South Africa, although independent, retains within itself the features of white colonialism. Secondly, since the end of the Second World War, at least, nationalism has the primary form taken by resistance to apartheid capitalism, see Amara in M.T. Murray, South African Capitalism and Black Political Opposition, especially pages 389 to 392. Nationalism is exemplified in the politics of the African National Congress, ANC, Pan-Africanist Congress, PAC, and even the South African Communist Party, SACP. The SACP believes that a national democratic revolution must be achieved before class revolution can take place. Previously, black nationalism was largely confined to black intellectuals and petty businessmen. And finally, the importance of a class perspective on national struggle and nationalism is increasingly obvious as the country moves by means of the, quote, reform period into a situation where the majority of black people are left out of the, quote, new South Africa, whilst at the same time a small elite of black mangers politicians, businessmen, professionals, and skilled, often unionized, black male workers are absorbed into the barely changed structures of state and capital, i.e. the white ruling class, see Morris, February 1993, in Work in Progress, number 87, pages 6 through 9. This is a clear case of class interests and divisions shattering the quote-unquote nation, it might be worth noting that the white nation is also fracturing in class lines as the white upper classes withdraw from white workers the privileges, e.g. Uh, job preservation and high wages, that used to buy the acquiescence of the latter. What follows is an attempt to extend Bonanno's analysis to the problems of building a revolutionary anarchist movement. Theoretical clarity is an essential part of this task. See Bratach Dub preface in this pamphlet. So let us examine the relationship between nationalism and class carefully. We must recognize two factors. Firstly, as anarchists, we must recognize that national oppression, like racism, sexism, etc., means that specific sections or fractions within the oppressed classes are doubly oppressed, both because of their class position and as a nationality. Three points follow. First, this means that within the oppressed classes, which are multinational, certain groups are subject to relations of national oppression. Second, because national oppression has its own independent reality from class oppression, etc., and is obviously not confined to any one class, it, like any other non-class oppressions, ergo race, etc., can and does provide the basis for cross-class alliances, class, which are not in the long-term interests of all oppressed classes. Third, it means that the unity of the oppressed classes cannot be assumed, that they must be easily and deeply divided. Secondly, we must not be blind to the fact that nationalism really does give people in the oppressed classes something. This something is identity, pride, a feeling of community and solidarity, and of course, physical self-defense. In the face of very real oppression, Class War, Unfinished Business, pages 50, 156 through 7. And nationalism, called ethnicity, can provide a very effective principle for organizing for sectional gains and material benefits for members of all classes involved. See in Chazan et al., Politics and Society in Contemporary Africa, Chapter 3. Also, Nelson Kasfir in Koldi. 
state and the development of, in the third world. In South Africa, Afrikaner nationalism was not only supported by white Afrikaner farmers, traders, professionals, and financiers, but also by white workers because it successfully addressed their poverty, oppression as Afrikaners. Most semi and unskilled whites were Afrikaners, and very real fears of black competition in the job market, etc. See L. Kalanikos, 1993, A Place in the City, pages 110 through 131, especially pages 120 through 123. So, how do these points bear on anarchism? If we are to forge an effective and successful movement, we must, firstly, recognize that the movement must be based on the oppressed classes. But we must recognize and challenge oppression within the class by specific and systematic work across all working class organizations, ergo, actively fighting racist attitudes, and by championing demands and struggles that unite the workers and the poor against the oppression that all share. That all share ergo low wages, and that also specifically fight the extra oppression that some face, ergo fighting racist pay gaps, discriminatory housing and services, etc. We need to link a range of popular organizations into a broader revolutionary mass movement, a revolutionary front of the oppressed classes that fights all oppression but steers clear of cross-class alliances with, elite, with the elites involving many different groups and individuals. They will have different experiences and approaches, and each will be good at different things, but will communicate and cooperate with one another. Class War, Unfinished Business, pages 135 through 6. Federalist structures are ideally suited to this task. At the same time, we must strive to unite the oppressed classes, guarding against the selfish manipulation of division by the bosses and the ambitious to fight in their own class interests, i.e., for the overthrow of the ruling class. Thirdly, we must combat the solidarity, etc., given by nationalism with class identity, pride, community, solidarity, history, culture, and achievements. Class War, Unfinished Business, page 50. Finally, our role as revolutionaries. Our aim is to build a revolutionary and libertarian worker-peasant movement based on the oppressed classes but recognizing oppression and struggle within the class, which will strive to increase the militancy of struggles to build a culture of revolution and to build a situation of counter-power, of people's power. In this way, we can make the revolution forward to a society based on direct democracy, not power, and need not greed. Introduction to the Second South African Edition, 2003, by Lucian van der Valt. The ongoing struggle in Palestine is only the most obvious of a number of national liberation struggles taking place worldwide. In Northern Ireland, in the Basque country in Spain, in Kurdish areas of Iraq and Turkey, in Kosovo, large popular movements for national liberation exist. For the revolutionary anarchists, such movements are of more than mere intellectual interest. The aim of revolutionary anarchism is to create, through a social revolution, a world based on social and economic equality and self-management of the workplace and the community. Therefore, no anarchist revolutionary can turn a blind eye to the question of the national liberation struggle. National liberation struggles are a social struggle against domination, a struggle founded on the demand of oppressed nationalities against discrimination and persecution and for equality and self-determination. What is national liberation? In short, these struggles are struggles against the domination of one people by another. They are struggles centered on questions of equal language and cultural rights and recognition of local cultures. They are struggles for political and social equality. They are struggles 
for equal access to resources, to welfare, to jobs, all jobs, to land. Above all, there are struggles which address concerns specific to an oppressed nationality, and they are struggles which center on a particular territory, fought by the distinct and oppressed nationality which lives in that territory under conditions of oppression and domination. As national liberation struggles grow and gather strength, they became mass movements, drawing in people from across the class and social spectrum in the oppressed nationality. To take one example, the Palestinian people have been fighting since the 1940s for a return to lands taken by the Israeli state, for a removal of Israeli army forces from Palestinian areas, for equal wages and access to jobs with Israelis, for free political activity and the right to choose their own destiny and to not exist as slaves, as subalterns, as subordinates to the Israelis. And this struggle has drawn in a great many people from the working class and peasantry. Because we oppose national oppression, because national liberation struggles draw in millions of working class and poor people, millions of peasant farmers, because we cannot stand silently by while blood is spilt in struggles for equality, we cannot stand aside. Mikhail Bakunin, the great anarchist revolutionary of the 1860s and 1870s, a lifelong advocate for, of the right to self-determination of oppressed nationalities declared strong sympathy for any national uprising against any form of oppression. For every people has the right to be itself. No one is entitled to impose its costume, its customs, its languages, and its laws. It was, quote, shameful, Bakunin added, to ignore national liberation struggles, for it meant in practice siding with states and empires that practice imperialism or national oppression. How do we relate to national liberation struggles? The question, however, is how the revolutionary anarchist movement relates to national liberation movements. Much confusion arises on the issue, and it is here that this important pamphlet by our comrade Alfredo Bonanno who today languishes in an Italian jail for his revolutionary activities, is invaluable, an indispensable guide. Two False Approaches There are two mistaken views on the national liberation struggle that exist in sections of the anarchist movement. The first is a left-wing view, the second rather more right-wing. Some anarchist comrades take the left-wing view, they have argued that anarchism is internationalist because it aims at an international revolution, an entirely new world. Therefore, these comrades argue, we cannot confine our attention to the Irish Catholics, or the Basques, or the Kurds, or the Palestinians. Some have even argued that taking sides in national liberation struggles would divide the working class and peasantry. These issues, they say, are best ignored. They do not really matter anyway. What is important is the class struggle. The left-wing view has some good points. It underlines the anarchist commitment to internationalism. It points to the importance of the class struggle. Where this view is mistaken is when it assumes, when it claims, that internationalism and the class struggle stand in contradiction to the national liberation struggles. A real internationalism a living internationalism is one that stands in concrete solidarity with the working class and peasantry the world over. And what does this mean if not solidarity with the working class and peasantry of oppressed nationalities in their struggles for national liberation? It is equally mistaken to see national questions as separate to the class struggle. The class struggle is the struggle of ordinary people to take control of their lives, to resist exploitation and domination. The class struggle necessarily, therefore, encompasses struggles against national oppression. The right-wing view in the anarchist movement on the issue of national liberation is one that holds that anarchists should uncritically support national liberation struggles. In practice, this means that comrades 
remain absolutely silent about the problems with some of the groups involved in these struggles. For many of these comrades, any current in the national liberation struggle that seems militant or calls itself revolutionary should be given a blank check of anarchist support. These comrades, in short, refuse to engage politically with national liberation movements and excuse this by saying it would be, quote, oppressive to do so. The great mistake of the right-wing approach is its refusal to recognize the national liberation struggles are complex and contradictory. Like the trade union movement, the national liberation struggles are made up of many different and contradictory political currents, some progressive and some reactionary. Class struggle and national liberation. Sometimes these different political currents even exist in the same organizations. On the one side, there are progressive currents that fight for the working class and peasantry that struggle to expand the realm of freedom, that struggle for a better life through direct action. On the other side, there are reactionary currents that love capitalism, hate democracy, love dictatorship, hate trade unions, and love only the most reactionary aspects of the oppressed nationality's culture, the elements that hate free thought, hate women, hate human rights. Precisely because national oppression affects everyone in an oppressed nationality, the class struggle takes place within national liberation struggles. The oppressed working class and peasantry fight for national liberation as part of the broader struggle for freedom and equality. The oppressed middle class and capitalist class struggle only to establish their own rule, they hate the capitalists of the oppressing nationality for limiting their scope to exploit, quote, their own people. These two different sets of classes, the masses and the elite, share no fundamental interests or aims. Even the culture of the nationality takes radically different forms for the masses and for the elite. Nationalism versus National Liberation What these reactionary currents all share is the ideology of nationalism, the ideology that maintains that class struggle is irrelevant, that oppressed workers and peasants must join hands with their own exploiters and aspirant exploiters to establish a national capitalism and national state. Their aim is quote-unquote national independence, meaning that local capitalists will replace foreign capitalists, local generals, the foreign generals, local governments, uh, government officials, the foreign officials. Nationalism is a reactionary current in the national liberation struggle, a reactionary current that simply cannot deliver any meaningful freedom for the working class and peasantry of the oppressed nationality. Nationalism is a reactionary current that sacrifices the masses on the altar of the elite. As Bakunin said, national liberation must be achieved as much in the economic as in the political interests of the masses. If the struggle is taken over by, quote, ambitious intent to set up a powerful state and carried out without the people, it will become hijacked by the privileged class and degenerate into a retrogressive, disastrous, counter-revolutionary movement. The ANC in South Africa is a perfect example. Established in 1912 by the African middle class, the ANC has always aimed at nothing more than the expansion of the African capital class. Whenever the African working class has sought to transform the ANC into a vehicle for its own specific demands, as it managed to do, to some extent, with the UDF, the trade union, and the civic struggles of the 1980s, the ANC leadership has fought back to silence and sideline the demands of the working class. The ANC leadership has used the trade unions to pursue its sectional and elitist agenda. The results are perfectly clear. 
The ANC leadership has betrayed every one of the demands of the African working class and contracted an unholy marriage with the big mine owners, factory bosses, and farmers. It implements the neoliberal gear policy, which has led to millions of job losses, to millions of evictions and cutoffs, to a wave of subcontracting and casualization, breaking every promise it made to the African working class and people in 1994. Yet it still calls on African workers to vote for it. There can be no common ground with such reactionary currents. Social Revolution or National Independence The role of anarchists in national liberation struggles is clear. Anarchists support struggles against national oppression, just as anarchists support struggles against the oppression of women, just as anarchists oppose capitalist wars. Anarchists support struggles for more political and economic and social rights. Even small victories are important because they increase the scope of working class and peasant self-activity, and because they inspire further and greater struggles. And anarchists support the dismantling of empires and of dictatorial states. Anarchists even defend the right of oppressed nationalities to establish their own states if they wish. We do not agree that this is the correct approach, but people have the right to mistakes without being locked in jail, without being shot down, without being butchered in the streets. We do not, therefore, ignore national liberation struggles, but see these as an important site of struggle for the working class and peasantry. However, our real aim is revolution, always revolution. Our main struggle is class struggle, always class struggle, and our aim is international change, always international. The key issue is the struggle for social and economic equality and the struggle for self-management. Therefore, our aim is to win national liberation movements to the struggle for social revolution, not the fraud of quote-unquote political independence. It is capitalism and the state which create national oppression. No one country can be free in a capitalist world. For the people of Palestine, freedom from Israel will not mean freedom from external giant corporations from outside its borders, economically, politically, culturally. It will inevitably be, at best, a junior partner of powerful forces from outside and will not, therefore, be truly independent. And the independent state will eventually be the tool of Palestinian capitalists, who will prove no more generous to their own working class and peasantry than the Israelis were. National oppression itself may disappear in that the Israeli tanks and laws will be withdrawn, but exploitation, poverty, and class rule will remain. And the new state will itself practice national oppression against its own internal national minorities. What else does South Africa after 1994 show but that the country remains dominated from outside by the United States and by the multinationals, by the World Bank and by the World Trade Organization, by, while the African majority of the working class languishes in the hell of poverty and the jail of unemployment, whilst the African capitalist class gorges itself at the trough with its close friends, big white business. Participation for Transformation From this basis, it is simply not good enough to write blank checks for to any and every current that exists in actual national liberation struggles, and to exist as nothing other than charity organizations, operating on the sidelines as fundraisers for any and every current that manifests in a national liberation struggle. Instead, anarchists must participate in the national liberation struggles and reshape them into revolutionary movements. We participate on the side of the oppressed classes, and we fight the domination of nationalism. As Bonanno says here, anarchists, quote, 
refuse to participate in national liberation fronts, unquote, that try to submerge the struggles of the working class and peasantry for the malignant purposes of local elites. Instead, anarchists participate in class fronts, which may or may not be involved in the national liberation struggles. Sometimes, this will mean allying on a temporary basis with currents who do not agree with us, sometimes even with nationalists on specific issues and campaign, but we remain politically independent, always, and we fight for anarchism, always. The aim is to foster the class struggle, to develop it in the direction of self-management and revolution, to defend the independence of the working class and peasantry, to develop a social rupture with nationalism, with capitalism and the state, and with the local elites. In practice, this means anarchists must participate in the more progressive currents in the national liberation struggle to transform them into a revolutionary direction. No blank checks here, rather a political struggle to promote class struggle, combat nationalism, and foster social revolution. The anarchist project concerning the national liberation struggle is very clear. It must not go towards constituting an intermediate stage toward the social revolution through the formation of new national states. Instead, writes Bonanno, the struggle must spread to establish economic, political, and social structures when in the liberated territories based on federalist and libertarian organizations. A New World And as part of this struggle, anarchists aim to promote alliances and unity with working classes and peasantries in other nationalities and other countries, in all other nationalities and countries, including those of the oppressing nation. The anarchists aim at uniting class struggle internationally. This means striving, without sacrificing the struggle for national liberation, to unite Palestinian and Israeli workers and peasants, Catholic and Protestant workers in Ireland, Kurdish workers and peasants in their Turkish and Iraqi class bro with their Turkish and Iraqi class brothers and sisters. All working class people and peasants share a common interest in improving their economic and social conditions in extending their political rights, in ending capitalism, in abolishing the state. Our approach to the national liberation struggle, therefore, is part of a broader struggle for an extension of, all for, of freedom for all. We do not promote ethnic and racial conflict. We struggle for the general extension of rights and freedoms and self-management. We struggle for universal principles, and we will not shy away from criticizing p the political currents and cultural practices that contradict those principles. We support only what is progressive, democratic, and socialist in a given culture. Nothing more, nothing less. For real autonomy and self-determination can only take place in a free world, in a world where there are no states, corporations, multinational or otherwise, no world banks, no world trade organizations. The new world will recognize and celebrate cultural identity. The new world will allocate international resources equitably to remove poverty and underdevelopment. The new world will unite all nationalities in a single world federation without sacrificing cultural difference and distinction. In such a world, based on libertarian communism, National oppression will disappear, social and economic equality will be real, and humankind will be united as never before, with the great and oppressed masses oppressed no more, but now and forever the architects of human destiny. Introduction to the 1976 Bratach Dub edition by Jean Ware Anarchists have tended to shy away from the problem of the national liberation struggle 
or rejected it entirely because of their internationalist principles. If internationalism is not to be merely meaningless rhetoric, it must imply solidarity between the proletariat of different countries or nations. This is a concrete term. When there is a revolution, it will be as it has been in the past, in, in a precise geographical area. How much it remains there will be directly linked to the extent of that internationalism, both in terms of solidarity and of the spreading of the revolution itself. The patriotism of the people at a basic, unadulterated level is the struggle for their own autonomy, a, national, a natural urge, a product of the life of a social group united by bonds of genuine solidarity and not yet enfeebled by the reflection or by the effect of economic and political interests as well as religious abstractions. Bakunin. Just as the state is an anti-human construction, so is nationalism a concept designed to transcend and thwart the class struggle which exists wherever capitalism does, all over the world. If the efforts of the people who are living in the social and economic ferment of what is happening under the name of national liberation are left to their leaders, they risk finding themselves no better off than before, living in micro-corporate states under whatever flag is chosen for them. Anti-imperialism can mask local corporatism if the struggle is not in class terms at a micro as well as macroscopic level. As the following article demonstrates, many of the Marxist groups engaged in national liberation struggles are none too clear on this point. Alfredo Bonanno's article was written in response to a real situation, that of Italy, in particular, and in particular Sicily, at the present time in that country, where economic and political disintegration is rife, the weakest link, Sicily, is being subjected to propaganda and actions directed towards creating a state of tension in order to lay the shaky foundations for a separatist solution. This solution, a separate Sicilian state, is being proposed by the forces of the right, i.e. the fascists, who, want, who have formed a tenuous working alliance with the mafia, who together are willing are the willing servants of U.S. interests through the intermediary of the CIA. Each party has its own interests to establish and protect. The mafia would gain access to political contacts and facilities for financial transactions. The Americans would keep their hold on an economy which is at present seeking solutions from the Communist Party and maintain a strategic base in the Mediterra Mediterranean. And the fascists, once in power, would gain credibility, enabling them to extend this power towards the north. Needless to say, the Sicilian proletariat would pay the price for this solution to the country's problems, in the same way as up until now they have paid in sweat and blood for the development of the North, as well as supplied cheap labor to the German and Swiss economies. This situation cannot be discarded as irrelevant to revolutionaries simply because when it reaches the international eye, it will be masked as a nationalist struggle. The basic truth of Sicilian, Sicilian reality is a super-exploited proletariat whose only solution can be sought through armed struggle for workers' autonomy through a federal or collectivist system of production and of exchange. To come nearer home, two situations immediately present themselves. The first, Ireland, which tends to be left aside as being too complicated or unconditionally supported as an anti-imperialist war. This anti-imperialism needs to be clarified. That the Irish proletariat will never run their own lives while British soldiers are occupying their land is a fact, but an internal dominator, whether republican or otherwise, with its own army or state apparatus, would be no less an obstacle. That the seeds of revolution that have always been identified with national independence exist in Ireland is a fact. But this fact is constantly being distorted by those 
with an interest in using racial and religious differences to their own ends. Only through revolutionary economic and social change, through the autonomous actions of the Irish exploited as a whole, supported by the exploited of Britain and the rest of the world, will ethnic differences be redimensioned and superstructural fantasies be destroyed. Counter-information must be brought out in opposition to the media, which have thrived on stirring up hatred around irrational issues. The economic foundations of these irrational issues should be, put, should be laid bare to the world, and economic solutions worked for through direct action to put production, distribution, and defense in the hands of the people themselves. In Scotland, big business has found new roots, and the nationalist argument is, providing, is proving to be effective in getting workers to sacrifice themselves for the false goal of, quote, building the national economy and curbing inflation through independence from Whitehall. Multinational interests can thrive on smaller centralized interdependent states rather than through the old concept of the powerful nation. At a social level, there are always personal, economic, and status interests to be gained. For example, revival of language often means the possibility of a new local elite evolved in the, in the media, education, and so on. At the same time, it is easy to understand why the exploited in deliberately underdeveloped Scotland look at the centers of British capitalism and interpret their misery through a nationalist optic. The revolutionary work of unmasking irrational nationalism should not disdain the basic struggle for identity and self-management or divert it into a passive waiting for an abstract world revolution. Anarchists must therefore work to show up the void of national self-determination and disrupt the corporate plans of parties, trade unions, and bosses by identifying the real struggle for self-appropriation and contributing to it in a concrete way. Along the road to generalized insurrection, techniques of sabotage and defense must be in the hands of those directly involved, eliminating dependence on outside groups and their ideologies in order for them to take over production and distribution and run their own areas on the basis of free federalism, collectivism, or both. Starting on this self-managed basis in a logic where the transitional phase finds no place the perspective of a wider federation of free people becomes a foreseeable reality. All this requires study and work, both at a practical and theoretical level. We hope that this pamphlet will be a small contribution towards this end. Glasgow, June 1976 Anarchism and the National Liberation Struggle, 1976 by Alfredo M. Bonanno Anarchism is internationalist. Its struggle does not confine itself to one region or area in the world, but extends everywhere alongside the proletariat who are struggling for their own liberation. This requires a declaration of principles which are not abstract and vague, but concrete and well-defined. We are not interested in a universal humanism which finds origin and justification in the French bourgeois revolution of 1789. The Declaration of Rights of, of the Rights of Man, a banner waved by all the democratic governments in power today, deals with an abstract man who is identified with the bourgeois ideal. We have often argued against a certain idealist anarchism which speaks of a universal revolution, acts of faith, illuminism, and in substance rejects the struggle of the proletariat and is anti-popular. This anarchism becomes an individual and mythological humanitarianism with no precise social or economic content. The whole planet comes to be seen as a biological unit, and discussions end in a sterile adjournment to the determining power of the superiority of the anarchist ideal over all other ideals. 
We think, on the contrary, that man is a historical being, who is born into and lives in a precise historical situation. This places him in certain relationships with economic, social, linguistic, and ethnic, etc. structures, with important consequences in the field of science, philo philosophical reflection, and concrete action. The problem of nationality is born from this historical direction and cannot be eliminated from it without totally confusing the very foundation of anarchist federalism. As Bakunin wrote, Every people, however small they are, possess in their own character their own particular way of living, speaking, feeling, thinking, and working, and this character, its specific mode of existence, is precisely the basis of their nationality. It is the result of the whole of the historical life and all the conditions of, of that people's environment, a purely natural and spontaneous phenomenon. The basis of anarchist federalism is the organization of production and distribution of goods, as opposed to the political administration of peoples. In fact, once the revolution is underway, and production and distribution comes to be handled in a collectivist or communist way, or in various ways according to the needs and possibilities, the federal structure with its natural limits would render the preceding political structure incongruous. It would be equally absurd to imagine such a wide limit as one extending over the whole of the planet. If there will be a revolution at all, it will be an incomplete one, and this must materialize in space. Territorial limits will then not necessarily coincide with the political confines of the preceding state, which has been destroyed by the revolution. In this case, the ethnic divisions would take, pla take the place of the deforming political one. The cohesive elements of the ethnic dimension are precisely those which help identify nationality and which have been so clearly expressed by Bakunin in the passage quoted above. Anarchists refuse the principle of the dictatorship of the proletariat, or the management of the proletariat by a revolutionary minority using the ex-bourgeois state. They implicitly refuse the political dimension of the existing bourgeois state from the very moment in which the revolution begins. We cannot accept the use of the state apparatus in a revolutionary sense. Therefore, the provisional limit will be given to the freely associated structures remains the ethnic one. It is in this sense that Kropotkin saw the Federation of Free Peoples based on the approximate and incomplete example of the medieval communes as a solution for to the social problem. But this argument, it must be clear, has nothing to do with separatism. The essential point of the argument we are making here is that there is no difference between the exploiters that, fact, that the fact of being born in a certain place has no influence on class divisions. The enemy is he who exploits, organizing production and distribution in a capitalist dimension, even if this exploiter then calls us compatriot, party comrade, or whatever other pleasing epithet. Class division is still based on exploitation, put into effect by capital with all the economic, social, cultural, religious, etc. means at its disposal, and the ethnic basis, which we identified, it at, which we identified as the limits of the revolutionary federation, have nothing to do with this. Unity with the internal exploiters is impossible, because no unity is possible between the class of workers and the class of exploiters. In this sense, Rocker writes, We are a-national. We demand the right of the free decision of each commune, each region, each people. Precisely for this reason, we reject the absurd idea of a unitarian, unitarian national state. We are federalists, that is, 
partisans of a federation of free human groupings, which do not separate themselves one from the other, but which, on the contrary, associate with the best of intimate ties through natural, moral, and economic relations. The unity to which we aspire is a cultural unity, a unity which goes forward on the most varied foundations, based on freedom and capable of repelling every deterministic mechanism of reciprocal relations. For this reason, we reject every particularism and every separatism under which is hidden certain individual interests. For here, we have an ideology where it is possible to discern the sordid interests of capitalist groups. There remains to this day, even among anarchists when confronting the problem of nationality, a living residual of idealistic reasoning. Not without reasoning, the anarchist Nito wrote in 1925, the dismembering of a country is not considered a desirable ideal by many revolutionaries. How many Spanish comrades would approve of the historical disappearance of Spain and its reorganization on a regional basis constituted of ethnic Castilian, Basque, Galician, and Catalan, etc. groups? Would the revolutionaries in Germany resign themselves to a dismembering similar to a libertarian type of organization which based itself on the historical groups of Bavaria, Baden, Westphalia, Hanover, etc.? On the other hand, these comrades would quite possibly like to see a dismembering of the present British Empire and a free independent reorganization of its colonies in Great Britain, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and overseas, which would not be pleasing to the English revolutionaries. Such are men, and in this way, in the course of the last war, the First World War, we saw the coexistence of the concept of nationality in a historical sense, alongside the revolutionary claims of anarchists, obviously referring to Kropotkin and the Manifesto of the Sixteen. Nito refers to the state of to a state of mind which has not been which has not changed much. Even today, either due to a persistence of the Illuminist or and Masonic ideals within a certain part of the anarchist movement, or due to a mental laziness which turns many comrades from the most burning problems and pushes them to less troubled waters, the reactions in the face of the problem of nationality are not very different to those described by Nito. In itself, the problem would not concern us much if it was not that it has a very precise historical outlet, and that the lack of clarity has extremely negative effects on the real struggles in the course of, the de of development. In substance, the problem of nationality remains at a theoretical level while that of the struggle for national liberation is taking on increasingly in, in today's world a practical relevance of great importance. The process of decolonization has intensified within many imperialist structures since the last war, urgently raising the problem of a socialist and internationalist interpretation of the national liberation struggle. The drama of the Palestinian people struggles in Ireland, the Basque countries, Africa, and Latin America are continually pro posing the problem with a violence hitherto unknown. Different economic forms within the same country determine a situation of colonization, guaranteeing the process of centralization. In other words, the persistence of a capitalist production requires inequalities in the rate of development in order to continue. Mandel writes on this subject, the inequality in the rate of development between different sectors and different firms is the cause of capitalist expansion. This explains how widened reproduction can continue until it reaches the exclusion of every non-capitalist means. Surplus value is thus realized by means of an increase in the concentration of capital. Mandel also treats unequal development between various areas of one political state. 
the basis the basic principle of capitalism is that although it can assure par partial equilibrium it can never assure total equilibrium that is to say it is incapable of industrializing systematically and harmoniously the whole of a vast territory in other words regional colonization is not a consequence of centralization but is on the contrary one of the preconditions of capitalist development naturally economic centralization goes with political centralization and any allusions to the democratic centralism to democratic centralism are merely demagogic demagogic formulae used at certain historical moments even superficially examining the facts of industrial and agricultural production from the unification of Italy to the end of the 1960s, one can clearly see that ta what tasks the state has assigned to the South to supply capital, especially immigrants' returns, taxes, etc., supply a cheap labor force, immigration to the North, and supply agricultural products in exchange for industrial ones on the basis of the relationship of colonial exchange. An objection to this could be that the state discriminates in a way between in this way between two bourgeois groups, the industrialists of the north and the landowners of the south. But to understand this we must bear in mind different possibilities of exploitation between a highly developed and an underdeveloped area. In the South, a 12 to 14 hour day was normal, while the 8 hour day had already been gained in the North. It is in this way, thanks to the various advantages of a still medieval conception of society, the Southern landowners continued to extract surplus value without much reinvestment. Thus, the development of the North was guaranteed through the exploitation and enslavement of the South. The political rule of the North dictated this direction, which then took the course of a capitalist production in general. Integration into the Italian capitalist system produced a disintegration of the Sicilian economy, which in many aspects is of a pre-capitalist type. The law of the market obliged the most backward regions to integrate with the basic capitalist system. This is the phenomenon of colonization, which comes about in foreign regions or nations, as well as in the internal regions of a single capitalist state. The next stage in capitalist development is the leap over the national frontier, which has been weakened by the polarization of the surrounding economies at the peaks of exchange monopolization. Colonization gives way to imperialism. Here is what the comrades of Front Libertaire wrote on the, on the question. National liberation movements must bear this reality in mind and not stop at the pre-imperialist analysis which would lead to a regional third worldism. That would mean that their revolutionary struggle would remain within the dialectic of colonizer colonized while ends to be attained would only be political independence, national sovereignty, regional autonomy, etc. This would be a superficial analysis and not take account of global reality. The enemy to be defeated by the Irish, the Bretons, the Provençals, for example, is not England and France, but the whole of the bourgeoisie, whether English, Breton, Provençal, or American. In this way, the ties which unite the regional bourgeoisie with the national and world bourgeoisie can be understood. In this way, national liberation goes beyond the simple internal decolonization and attacks the real situation of imperialist capitalist development, putting the objective of the destruction of the political state into a revolutionary dimension. Ethnic limits also become easily recognizable. The ethnic limit is the revolutionary process of free federations of production and distribution associations, has its counterpart in the pre-revolutionary phase 
with a class dimension. The ethnic base of today consists of the whole of the exploited people who live in a given territory of a given nation, there being no common ethnic base between exploiter and exploited. It is logical that this class basis will be destroyed along with the destruction of the political state, where the ethnic limit will no longer coincide with the exploited living within a given territory, but with the whole of the men and women living in that territory who have chosen to live their lives freely. On this problem, the comrades of Front Libertaire continue. Ethnic culture is not that that of all who are born or who live in the same territory and speak the same language. It is the culture of those who, in a given group, suffer the same exploitation. Ethnic culture is class culture, and for this reason is revolutionary culture. Even if the class consciousness of the workers corresponds to a working class in a situation of national dependence, it is nevertheless the class consciousness which will carry the struggle to its conclusion, the destruction of capitalism in its present state. The decisive struggle to be carried out must be a worldwide class struggle of exploited against exploiters, beginning from a struggle without frontiers with precise tactics against the nearest bourgeoisie, especially if they proclaim themselves nationalist. This class struggle is moreover the only way of saving and stimulating the ethnic specification on which it would be impo it would be possible to build a stateless socialism. The anarchist program concerning the national liberation struggle is therefore clear. It must not go towards constituting an intermediate stage towards the social revolution through the formation of new national states. Anarchists refuse to participate in national liberation fronts. They participate in class fronts, which may or may not be involved in the national liberation struggles. The struggle must spread to establish economic, political, and social structures in the liberated territories based on federalist and libertarian organizations. Revolutionary Marxists, who, for reasons we cannot analyze here, monopolize the various situations where national liberation struggles are in course, cannot always reply with such clarity to the perspective of a radical, radical contestation of state uh, centralization. Their myth of the withering away of the bourgeois state and their pretension of using it creates an insurmountable problem. Marxists and the National Liberation Struggle If we can share the class analysis made by some Marxist groups, such as that elaborated by a part of the ETA, which we published in number three of Anarchismo, what we cannot accept is the fundamental hypothesis of the formation of a worker's state based on the dictatorship of the proletariat, more or less along the lines of the preceding political state according to the organizational capacity of the individual national liberation organizations. For example, the ETA comrades were fighting for a free Basque country, but are not very interested in a free Catalonia or a free Andalusia. Here we come back to the doubts so well expressed by Nito, which we quoted above. At the basis of many Marxist analysis, there lurks an irrational nationalism, which is never very clear. Going back to the Marxist classics and their polemic with Bakunin, we are able to reconstruct a kind of dialogue between the two, glancing at a similar piece of work done by the Bulgarian comrade Balkansky. In 1848, immediately after the Slav Congress, where he had unsuccessfully developed the idea of a Slav federation to reunite a free Russia and all the Slav peoples to serve as a first nucleus for a future European federation and then a greater universal federation of peoples, Bakunin took part in the insurrection of Prague. 
Following the Prague events, Bakunin, hunted by the police, took refuge in Berlin and established close contacts with a few Czech students with the aim of attempting an insurrection in Bohemia. At this time, the beginning of 1849, he published Appeal to the Slavs, which resulted in him being quite unjustly accused of pan-Slavism. Marx and Engels replied with a sour criticism in their paper Neue Rheinische Zeitung. Let us now see this hypothetical dialogue as it is suggested by Belonsky. Bakunin. The Slav peoples who are enslaved under Austria, Hungary, and Turkey must reconquer their freedom and unite with Russia, free from Tsarism in a Slav federation. Marx Engels. All these small, powerless, and stunted nations basically owe re recognition to those who, according to historical necessity, attach them to some great empire, thereby allowing them to participate in a historical development which, had they been left to themselves, would have remained quite foreign to them. Clearly such a result cannot be reached without treading upon some sensitive areas. Without violence, nothing can be achieved in history. Bakunin. We must allow, in particular, for the liberation of the Czechs, the Slovaks, and the Moravians, and their reunification in one single entity. Marx Engels. The Czechs, who, among whom we must include the Moravians and the Slovaks, have never had a history. After Charlemagne, Bohemia was amalgamated with Germany. For a while, the Czech nation emancipated themselves to formed the great Moravian Empire. Consequently, Bohemia and Moravia were definitively attached to Germany, and the Slovak regions remained to Hungary. And this inexistent nation, from a historical point of view, is demanding independence? It is inadmissible to grant independence to the Czechs, because then East Germany would seem like a small loaf gnawed away by a rat. Bakunin the Poles, enslaved by three states, must belong to a community on an equal basis along with their present dominators, the Germans, the Austrians, the Hungarians, and the Russians. Marx Engels The Germans' conquest of the Slav regions between the Elba and the Wartha was a geographical and strategical necessity resulting from the divisions of the Carlovingian Empire. The reason is clear. The result cannot be questioned. This conquest was in the interest of civilization. There can be no doubt about it. Bakunin The southern Slavs, enslaved by a foreign minority, must be freed. Marx Engels It is of vital necessity for the Germans and the Hungarians to cut themselves out of the Adriatic. Geographical and commercial considerations must come before anything else. It is perhaps a pity that magnificent California has recently been snatched from the inept Mexicans who do not know what to do with it. The quote-unquote independence of a few Spaniards in California and Texas might, be, might possibly suffer. Quote-unquote justice and other moral principles are perhaps denied in all that. But what can be done in the face of so many other events of this kind in universal history? Bakunin. So long as one single persecuted nation exists, the final and complete triumph of democracy will not be possible anywhere. The oppression of a people or a single individual is the oppression of all, and it is not possible to violate the liberty of one without violating the liberty of all. Marx Engels. In the Pan-Slav Manifesto, we have found nothing but these more or less moral categories. Justice, humanity, freedom, equality, fraternity, independence, which sound good, but which can do nothing in the political and historical field. We repeat, not one Slav people, apart from the Poles, the Russians, and perhaps the Turkish Slavs, has a future for the simple reason that all the other Slavs lack the most elementary historical, geographical, political, and industrial bases. Independence and vitality fail them. The conquerors of the various Slav nations 
have the totality. Bakunin. The liberation of and federation of the Slavs is only the prelude to the union of European republics. Marx Engels. It is impossible to unite all peoples under a republican flag with love and universal fraternity. It is in the bloody struggle of a revolutionary war that unification will be forged. Bakunin. Certainly, in the social revolution, the West, and especially the Latin peoples, will precede the Russians, but it will nevertheless be the Slav masses who will make the first revolutionary move and will guarantee the results. Marx Engels We replied that the hatred of the Russians and the first revolutionary passion of the Germans, and now the hatred of the Czechs and the Croats, are the beginning to intersect. The revolution can only be saved by putting into effect a decisive terror against the Slav peoples who, for their perspective of their miserable national independence, have sold out democracy and the revolution. Some day we shall take bloody revenge upon the Slavs for this vile and scandalous betrayal. There can be no doubt about these radical counterpositions. Marx and Engels remain tied to the determinist view of history, which is intended to be materialist, but which is not free from certain Hegelian premises, lessening the possibility of an analytical method. Moreover, they, especially Marx, let fly on strategic evaluations which reveal an emphasis on liberal patriotism, which, if it was justifiable in 1849, was a lot less so in 1855. Nevertheless, at this time, during the Crimean War, he writes, The great peninsula south of the Sava and the Danube, this marvelous country, has the misfortune of being inhabited by a conglomeration of races and nationalities which are very different, and one cannot say which would be best suited for progress and civilization. Slavs, Greeks, Romanians, Albanians, almost 12 million in all, are dominated by a million Turks. To this day, we might, one might ask if of all these races, the Turks were not the most qualified to have the hegemony which can evidently be exercised over this mix, mixed population by one nation. And again in 1879, in the course of the Russian-Turkish War, which today communists call the Bulgarian Patriots War of Liberation, Marx wrote, We definitely support the Turks, and that for two reasons. The first is that we have studied the Turkish peasants, that is, the Turkish popular masses, and we are convinced that they are one of the most representative, hard-working, and morally healthy of the European peasants. The second is that the defeat of the Russians will accelerate considerably the social revolution which is rising to a period of radical transformation in the whole of Europe. In fact, the Marxist movements for national liberation, when ruled by a minority who eventually transform themselves into a party, a generalized situation at the present time, end up using strategic distinctions, leaving the essential problems which in point of fact also influence strategy in second place. The Marxists do not, for example, go on into the difference between the imperialism of large states and the nationalism of small ones, often using the term nationalism in both cases. This causes great confusion. The nationalism of the small states is often seen as something which contains a positive nucleus, an internal revolt of a social character, but the detailed class distinction is usually limited to the strictly necessary, according to strategic perspectives. It is often maintained, unconsciously, following in this the great maestro Trotsky, that if, on the one hand, the upsurge of the people and the oppressed minorities is immutable, the working class vanguard must never try to accelerate this thrust, but limit themselves to following the impulses while remaining outside. This is what Trotsky wrote in January 1931. 
The separatist trends in the Spanish Revolution raised the democratic problem of the right of a nationality to self-determination. These tendencies, seen superficially, have worsened during the dictatorship. But while the separatism of the Catalan bourgeoisie is nothing but a means for them to play the Madrid government against the Catalan and Spanish peoples, the separatism of the workers and the peasants is just the covering of a deeper revolt of a social nature. We must make a strong distinction between these two types of separatism. Nevertheless, it is precisely to distinguish the workers and peasants oppressed in their national sentiment from the bourgeoisie that the vanguard of the proletariat must take up this question of the right of the nation to autonomy, which is the most courageous and sincere position. The workers will defend totally and without reserve the right of the Catalans and the Basques to live as independent states in the case of the majority opting for a complete separation, which does not mean to say at all that the working elite must push the Catalans and Basques on the road of separatism. On the contrary, the economic unity of the country, with great autonomy for nationalities, would offer the workers and peasants great advantage from the economic point of view and from that of a culture in general. It is clear to see that the counterposition is the most radical possible. Marxists and Trotskyists follow systems of reasoning which for us have nothing to do with the free decision of the exploited minorities to determine the conditions of their own freedom. It is not the case to take up the fundamental theoretical differences, but it is enough to reread Trotsky's passage to realize the theoretical ambiguities it contains, and how much space is given to a political strategy favorable to the establishment of a dictatorship by a quote-unquote illuminated minority, and how little would be done towards the real freedom of the exploited. The ambiguous use of the term separatism should be underlined, and the insistence upon irrational arguments such as those relative to the quote-unquote national sentiment. Conclusion Many problems have been raised in this work, with the awareness that they have only been done so in part due to their wide complexity. We began from a situation of fact, that of Sicily, and a process of dismembering capable of causing incalculable damage in the near future. We have said how this process sees, in our opinion, a union of fascists and mafia, and how the interests which these people want to protect are substantially those of the Americans. The circulation of a certain stale separatist formulae which has obliged us to take as clear as possible a position and seek a, to single out the essential points of anarchist internationalism in the face of the problem of the national liberation struggle. We have also given a brief panoramic sketch of a few of the interpretive defects latent in the orthodox Marxist view of the problem and a few strategic, strategic obtusities which in practice determine the no small difficulties which the Marxist-inspired national liberation movements find themselves. We shall now try to conclude our research with a few indications of theoretical interest. We must thoroughly re-examine the problem of the relationship between structure and superstructure. Many comrades remain within the Marxist model and do not realize it. So much this has penetrated our current way of seeing things. The power which the Marxists now hold in our universities allows them to propose a certain analytical model to the intellectual minorities, selling it off as reality with their usual complacency. In particular, it is the conception of means of production which must be put to careful analysis, showing the limitations and consequences of the deterministic use of the economic factor. Today, economic reality has changed and cannot fit into the Marxist typology. Nevertheless, they do their utmost to complicate matters by attempting to thus explain events which would otherwise be easily explicable. 
interpolating more open models of reasoning, we should be able to identify relevant factors such as precisely the national and cultural or ethnic particularities. These enter into a wider process of exploitation and determine a quantitative changes, rendering possible exploitation itself in the last and in the last analysis cause the emergence of other changes, this time of a qualitative nature. Peoples and classes, po political and cultural formations, ideological movements, and the concrete struggle all undergo interpretive changes in relation to the basic model. If a mechanistic determinism is accepted, the consequences are the inevitable dictatorship of the proletariat, the passage towards a not easily understood and historically non-documentable progressive elimination of the state. On the contrary, if the interpretive model is open and indeterministic, if individual will comes to be included in a process of reciprocal influence with class consciousness, if the various social socio-cultural entities are analyzed not only economically, but also more widely, socially, the consequences would be very different. Preconceived statist ideas would give way to the possibility of a horizontal libertarian construction, a federalist project of production and distribution. Certainly, all this requires not only the negation of a mechanistic materialism, which, in our opinion, is the result of Marxism, but also a certain idealism which, still in our opinion, comes to infect a part of anarchism. In the same way, universalism, intended as an absolute value, is ahistorical and idealized, because such a luministic postulating is nothing other than the inverted ideal of reformed Christianity. It is not possible to see clearly behind the Western hegemony how much of it was developed by the ideology of a false freedom, an ambiguous humanitarianism with a cosmopolitan basis. The myth of the white man's dom domination is represented in various forms as the myth of civilization and science, and therefore as the foundation of the political hegemony of a few states over others. The Masonic and Illuminist ideology could bolster the Jacobinism hidden within the Leninist vision of Marxism, but has nothing to do with anarchism, despite the fact that many comrades continue to amuse themselves with abstract schemes and outdated theories. Anarchists should give all their support, concrete regarding participation, theoretical concerning analyses and study, to national liberation struggles. This should be begun from the autonomous organization of the workers, with a clear vision of class counterpositions, that is putting the local bourgeoisie in their correct class dimension, and prepare the federalist construction of the future society which should rise from the social revolution. On this basis, which leaves no room for determinisms and idealisms of various species, any fascist instrumentalization of the oppressed people's aspirations can be easily fought. It is necessary, though, that in the first place we become clear among ourselves, looking forward and building the correct analyses for an anarchist revolutionary strategy. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.